Good morning. Uh, you know, one of the great things that I like about the DEF CON, well, besides of the great talks and everything, well, I believe it's the, uh, the first con uh, conference that starts at 10 a.m., right? Yeah, it's great. Well, you know what? I'm having some uh, difficulties uh, sleeping last, uh, last couple of days due to some uh, uh, jet lag problems. Well, basically, my clock has been shifted about 10 hours. Last night, I, was, I woke up at about uh, 3 a.m. Well, I thought to myself, it must be a beautiful day. No, it was. So basically, what we're going to talk about today, we're not going to talk about my jet lag problems. We're going to talk about managed code rootkits. Um, my name is Erez Metula. I'm a secure uh, a software engineer working at To Be Secure, working as the application security department manager. And what we're going to see today, we're going to see uh, injections into the managed code environment. And basically, we're going to start with a simple example, a very tr trivial question, which goes uh, like this. Well, this is the uh, 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 software engineering uh, 101 class, which talks about hello world in Java. Well, basically, what does the following code you do? Supposed to print the string hello world, right? So let's run this code, and let's see what happens. So basically, I'm having this class, that the, the, the hello world.java class. So when I'm going to run this class, well, it's give me this strange behavior. Well, basically, the string that was supposed to be printed, the hello world, was printed twice. And the reason for that to happen is that because the internal implementation of the managed code was modified. So that the, the code, uh, basically, what the code is, uh, what the application level code says, it's not necessarily what it's going to do. And this is a little, little bit of problem when we are doing code reviews. Well, when we are doing code reviews, the malicious code might not be at the application level. Um, but this was just a simple example of language modification. Uh, we're going to use this uh, example of language modification and take this further and further in that uh, we'll be able to inject rootkits into runtime, uh, into application virtual machine runtimes. Um, and what we're going to talk about today, we're going to start with the managed code uh, environment uh, uh, execution model. We'll start with an overview about that. We're going to talk about managed code rootkits and how to implement managed code rootkits. What's so uh, special about that? We'll see uh, a couple of demos and a couple of attack scenarios so that we can understand that uh, managed code rootkits can be very dangerous and they have their own advantages um, uh, uh, due to some uh, very uh, interesting uh, techniques. And I'm going to expose to you a tool that I wrote called .NET Sploit. Well, a .NET Sploit is a custom language modification tool. It uh, enables you to change and to customize your own version of the .NET language. Um, well, it is a general purpose tool. I use it to uh, show the attacks that I, uh, uh, that I uh, have demos for. Um, but basically, it is a, you can use it for any purpose you like. You can even take it, and it's an open source, and customize it to other languages. So um, a little bit of background. It, it all started uh, with the idea of, of changing the language back in 2008. Um, I played a little bit with the uh, .NET language modification. Um, well, soon uh, I, I realized that it might lead to some very interesting attack. Um, I wrote, wrote a paper about, about it called .NET Framework Rootkits, uh, Backdoors Inside Your Framework. Um, I presented it in, in Black Hat uh, uh, Europe and in CancerQuest. But uh, .NET Rootkits was just a case study. So, uh, and people actually thought that there is a problem with the .NET framework and that the concept that I was talking about was .NET specific. Well, it wasn't. And it was really, really important to me to, to show you guys the, the, the general purpose uh, uh, case so that I'm, I'm also going to talk about uh, Java rootkits today. Uh, so I'm taking another language as an example to show you the, the general uh, uh, case study. So uh, what is a managed code? Well, managed code is code that runs and executes under the management of a virtual machine, an application level virtual machine. Um, for example, the JVM, the Java JVM, or the .NET CLR. Um, well, think about it as, uh, uh, as an operating system for applications. So basically, this is another language we are talking about. We're talk not talking about assembly language, um, but we, we are talking about a virtual language. Um, 
We are talking about a high-level, object-oriented intermediate language. Basically, it looks like assembly, but it has the characteristics of an, uh, an object-oriented language. We can uh, create uh, uh, objects, and we have classes and inheritance and stuff like that. Well, basically, it looks something like this. This is how uh, uh, Java bytecode looks like after disassembling. So uh, as you might see, it, it looks kind of like an assembly code, but it's not. Um, if I will execute this code, if I give the CPU this kind of code, it will not understand what I'm talking about. The CPU does not understand virtual languages. But basically, uh, uh, the magic that uh, is being performed is, is being uh, performed using the virtual machine that translates the high-level intermediate language um, to the machine-specific assembly code. So that if I'm having uh, uh, an executable, and sorry guys about uh, my graphics, I sucked in graphics, but uh, what I wanted to show you here is that the same executable can be run on the different platforms. So we have a Windows machine and a Linux machine and a Mac and mainframe and et cetera, et cetera. But for each machine, there is a specific virtual machine. So we have that for Windows, it's, it's the, the, the virtual machine is in blue. And for uh, the Linux box is for in green. And, and basically, sorry, basically uh, what, has been ha what happened here is that the executable uh, is executed inside the virtual machine that translates the just, just in time code and gives that to the CPU. So basically, the virtual machine acts as a bridge to the CPU. Well, uh, a couple of examples of managed code runtimes. So we're talking about Java, JVM, .NET Framework, the PHP Z engine, um, the Flash uh, 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 Action Script uh, virtual machine, the AVM, Python, Dalvik. Basically, there are lots of languages which are virtual machine based. Uh, and today we're going to discuss .NET and Java as the case studies, uh, basically because uh, they're, they're very common languages. Many projects are written today uh, uh, using uh, .NET and Java, and because their model is very similar and, and very easy to understand. So a little bit of, of overview of Java execution model. Well, basically we have three layers, uh, as opposed to, for example, uh, a code which... The quality of the following recording is not up to our usual standards. However, we are releasing this due to the importance of the material presented. It's unmanaged, for example, C or C++ code, in which you have the executable, which contains compiled code, compiled assembly code, and you have the, the OS. Basically, now we're talking about three layers, not two. We have the application, we have the, the, the runtime, in our example, this is the JVM, and we have the OS. So when the application source code is compiled, and we have a bytecode class, it is hosted inside the JVM. The JVM loads the class libraries from the from JAWS based on the name, and well, it generates using a just-in-time compiler uh, a code that uh, uh, which is machine-specific, and this is why what the OS, the CPU looks uh, and sees and executes. Well, the .NET model is pretty much the same. So only that now we have uh, assemblies. This is .NET notation for compiled code. We're talking about EXEs and DLLs. And now the, the, the code is being loaded, uh, uh, the, the, the libraries is being loaded from the GAC, the Global Assembly Cache. This is where all the low-level uh, all, all, all the low-level methods are being uh, uh, stored. Well, think about it as system calls. Basically, this is where the code is, is located. This is where functions are being uh, implemented. And again, the jitter is, is uh, generating machine-specific code, and this is what the, the, the machine is executing. So. Um, what, is, what are managed code rootkits or MCRs? Well, managed code rootkits, uh, this is a user mode application level rootkits hidden inside the managed code environment libraries. Well, I know that uh, most of you guys think about, well, user level mode, uh, this, this is not like kernel level mode, kernel level mode is awesome, well, in kernel level mode we do we can use, uh, uh, many things. Well, there is a couple of great things that you can do in user mode. In user mode, well, Although you are sacrificing a little bit uh, 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 of, of hiding, um, you can do very sophisticated attacks, and you can do very sophisticated, very uh, 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 sophisticated logical attacks. So that the target of the of MCRs is the virtual machine that provides the services to the upper level application. So basically, we are hiding information from the application. Not in traditional rootkits when we are hiding from the OS or maybe from the CPU or stuff like that. We are hiding it from applications. So um, the influence that we have is on all, all of the applications that run on a specific virtual machine. And basically what we can do, we can do uh, stuff like regular rootkits. So for example, we can hide files and we can hide uh, processes and registry keys and stuff like that. We can 
also do some very interesting logic problems. Um, a little bit of advantages of MCRs. Well, first thing is that it is an overlooked place. No one looks at virtual machines for malicious code. No antivirus, IPSs, IDSs, stuff like that. They understand intermediate language. They don't know if you're writing your malicious code. It does not. They not, do not understand it. Um, well, uh, basically, they can also cannot tell whether your application is doing something wrong. From from it, its point of view, um, the application can do whatever it wants. So basically, they, it cannot detect uh, uh, those kind of malicious behavior. Well, forensics. Forensics checklist does not cover virtual machines, right? So basically, if forensic guys over here uh, today, you have another place, another place to look for, so that uh, it's not just the, the, the operating system binaries. You look for also for other places. And basically, another interesting, interesting things is about developers and developers backdoors. Now we're talking about malicious developers that they, they know that their code uh, will be audited. And they know that some security guy will uh, uh, open their own code, maybe looking for backdoors. They will not hide it inside application level. Hide it downstairs virtual machine level. We're also talking about universal word kits. Due to the fact that the virtual machine performs the translation for us, we can write code which is not machine specific, right? The same code, the same malicious code will be translated to the machine specific instruction set using the virtual machine. This is what I call universal rootkits. And we have large attack surface due to the fact that virtual machines are, are pre-installed on operating systems. We have Java and .NET are pre-installed in, in latest uh, OS versions. Um, we can deploy all of, we can, sorry, we can control all of the applications from only one place. Think about a scenario of, uh, for example, the hosting uh, uh, web server in which you're controlling all of the application's behavior using only one injection. Um, well, another interesting thing is that the, 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 the MCRs are becoming part, sorry, the managed code becomes part of the operating system. Microsoft is pushing very hard uh, for that, that the .NET will be able to uh, perform uh, more and more things. Uh, let's take an example, .NET PowerShell commandlets. Um, and and, and the, the, the last thing is that we, we can uh, perform some very sophisticated attacks as we're going to see today. So uh, when we are talking about uh, language modification, the root fig, rootkit implementation, basically what we see here, we see the, the, the three layers. We see here the application level, the runtime level, and the OS level. So basically when, a, when an application calls some specific runtime method, Basically, the, 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 the runtime method, and this is the, the implementation of the runtime method, it is being called and executed. In MCR, we're taking away this method, throwing away, and writing our own implementation. So now, when the application calls runtime method, well, basically, it does something different, right? So when a call comes um, to this method, well, it, go, it goes, generates the code, and the system will be hacked. No one can see that. You cannot detect it from the application. If we're talking about an example, and in the beginning we saw the, the, the demo of, J of Java right line twice, it was print line, this, this is a, a, a Java version for printing a string. We can do the same thing in, in .NET. So basically this is the same code that was uh, uh, able to perform the same thing the string twice, so I'm just giving it here as a reference. But basically this is the original code, what I did in order to, to make uh, every, to, to print of every string twice, I just doubled the code. And the modified code looks like this. So basically, I, I took the same thing and doubled the code. I had to, to uh, uh, rearrange a little bit the addresses, right? Because uh, basically, uh, uh, I had to calculate. And uh, uh, this is a very intensive task. Now I just had to calculate the three lines of code. When we're talking about injections of very sophisticated attacks, a very uh, a large amount of code, you have to do a very large amount of calculations. Um, a little bit about the attack scenarios. Well, um, well, messing with the, the sandbox, messing with the application virtual machine usually requires administrator level privileges. Um, and basically, we're talking about two main scenarios. One scenario, this is the scenario of housekeeping attack vector. Now we're talking about post exploitation attacks in which the attacker has already managed to gain control of the system using some other kind of, of vulnerability. Now he has control of the system, and now he's thinking, what should I do next? 
so he can utilize MCRs to his proposal, right? This is another alternative attack vector so he can use. But in the second scenario, we're talking about this, the trusted insider. This is one of the major problems that we're facing today in security, in which uh, those of the people that already have access to the system, now we're talking about IT managers, we're talking about developers, DBAs, those guys already have administrator level access. They don't have to steal the, 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 this access, right? So they can uh, take advantage of it and probably install an MCR. Think about an admin, uh, uh, sorry, a developer, for example, that uh, is developing a very sensitive financing application, uh, and he knows, for example, that he'll be uh, reviewed, and he wants to enter some kind of code that says, "Hey, if you if you see my own bank account, well, give me a little bit of grace, right?" And th those kind of backdoors are very common uh, when we're talking with, about uh, uh, malicious developers. Um, the implementation techniques can be divided uh, basically to two, to two uh, 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 parts. Well, we have the non-invasive techniques. Those are the ones that are called by design technique. By design techniques are uh, techniques in which you are not hacking anything. You are just utilizing something which was there by design, so that the virtual machine lets you change its meaning uh, using its own, its own controls and own uh, uh, mechanism. For example, AOP. AOP uh, or aspect-oriented programming using dynamic weaving lets you uh, inject code into applications. Uh, uh, configuration modification, for example, setting an alternative evil class loader, or for example, loading a malicious, malicious agent in Java, this is how you do that. And maybe messing with the machine config in .NET. You can do that in all those techniques. But this is not something which is evasive. If the application will query the, the virtual machine, it knows about it. And what we're going to discuss today, that we're going to discuss invasion techniques, in which we're talking about direct modification of the intermediate language code, so that the application will not know that something happened. Basically, the virtual machine lies to the application. Right? So, and when we're talking about Java techniques, Java rootkits, um, this is just an example of an invasion technique. There are many, many ways of performing the same thing. What I did here is uh, uh, I took the, the print stream class, this class uh, uh, which implements the print line. I extracted it from rt.jar, rt, which is the ru runtime uh, uh, jar containing all of the code of, the, of most of the Java runtime. I extracted it out, disassembled it using Jasper disassembled, disassembler, modified the code, recompiled it back, reassembled it back using Jasmine assembler, and deployed it back into the run. Right? Um, well, basically, for more information, you can access this site and get uh, it. Um, but the interesting thing is that well, you can change the, 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 the dotted language by that and the application will be about. But doing the same thing in, in .NET, well, the concept is pretty much similar, but it's a little bit more complicated. Because in .NET, we have, uh, we have the, the, the signature mechanism. And in .NET, we have a signature called strong name in which all of the assemblies are being, uh, the assemblies have uh, their own signatures. So I cannot just take the DLL, change it, and put it back in its location because the signatures does not match, right? So what I thought in the beginning, in the beginning of my research, I was thinking about, well, uh, I will just disable the signature mechanism, right? Or I can just uh, 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 find where the, the, the operating system is hiding the private key and maybe resign back everything, right? But I found a, a, a better way of doing that. And the way of doing that, which is very simple, it's, it's very funny that how it happens, is that, well, the GAC, this is where the location of the DLL is stored. This is in C Windows Assembly GAC32. Here you have a directory for each assembly. So, for example, MS Colib, which is one of the most important DLLs, um, uh, MS Colib can have many versions. So each version contains its own directory that says what is the, ver what is the version of the DLL. So here we can see... Uh, uh, the .NET 2.0 uh, DLL for MS Colib, and this is the signature of it. Well, it turns out that if you take the DLL and put it back to its location in this directory, and this is going to take the signature of it. It looks at the signature. It says, hey, I need to, to load the DLL containing this signature while well, I just load it from there. So it's no signatures are checked. 
and basically what's so funny about this is that um, basically uh, if we if we think, uh, look into it um, well, basically uh, this mechanism uh, 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 even though that there was some signatures checked well, basically the attacker could disable the rules anyway right so basically due to performance issues the, ver the ver verification was the same so now all you have to do is just write your DLL to the same location to the correct location that you want and the last thing that you want to do is to uh, avoid engine engine is uh, a pre-compiled code so we would like to throw away the cached version of the of the old code, right so you just disable the old code the caching using engine uninstall and the, 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 the previous DLL basically from here on you can remove traces with, with engine go read the white paper that it has it contains information about this kind of stuff. Um, up until now, we've talked about the, the, the techniques of changing the .NET language or the Java language. Uh, from now on, we're talking about more generic stuff. Basically, one of the important things is that we can extend the language, we can add features to the language, we can add new methods. We can uh, I call it method or function injection because you're adding new uh, methods to the language. For example, if you want to do the same thing again and again and again, then why? Uh, because of, uh, uh, instead of writing the same code, just wrap your code as a new method, right? And the best parameters. To it. Just call your method. So basically, I've implemented a couple of methods. One of them is, is called center URL. Uh, what it says is, is, is that well, it will send some data from an attack machine uh, to the attacker. So the parameters is where to send it and what is the data. Reverse shell. Please open a reverse shell for me for in IP and port, some specific uh, stuff that I will uh, call for this function. Hide file, um, inject class, man in the middle, which returns a man in the middle socket, and the key log event handler. All of those are examples of things that can be injected into runtimes. But when we're talking about uh, managed code, we usually managed code is implementing object oriented concepts. And one of the interesting things about object-oriented is that we have the notion of, uh, uh, of inheritance. So basically, if you have a class that you want the class to contain code, to extend code of other class, you're just inheriting from that class. And, well, all of the classes are inheriting from a class called object. So basically, we have it, uh, something like a tree of classes, and object is the, is the upper, upmost uh, uh, class. So basically, if we want to inject code that will be inherited to all of the classes in the in the runtime, all we have to do is inject it into object. Uh, and, and we can do other interesting things. For example, we can uh, inject into a subtree, uh, into a branch. For example, let's say that we want to inject only to this subtree. So all we have to do is uh, inject into here. Right? So basically, inheritance will do it for us. So we just need to look for So, um, a, a little bit about the development scenarios, what we can do, many interesting things, and I want to save time to show you some demos. So let's start with the first one. Well, the first one, um, here we're talking about stealing the authentication credentials from the runtime authentication mechanism. We're not talking about the application level authentication code. We're talking about the runtime method, a Boolean method that gets uh, from the application user and the password and returns back the true false answer. So what we're going to see about here is that we're going to inject into an internal authentication method code that says something like, well, take the username and password that you now have. Well, this is an internal class members. Take it from, from the class and send it to the attacker using uh, our own sent to URL class, right? So we've inject, injected the code sent to URL method, and now we are just calling it and saying, well, I want to send you to me uh, the username and password of the user. And let's hear a demo about that. Well, in our demo, we're going to see a, 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 an attacked application. Well, think about a hosting application, a hosting management system in which you have many applications on the same machine. We are attacking all of them at once. So uh, we're talking about uh, a rich bank, uh, a rich bank server, which uh, we have many users, and the, 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 the login page, if this is the login page, this is the login page code, the login page code calls, and the action of the, the button click is to call forms authentication, authenticate, sending the username and password, and calling the runtime uh, 
method. So runtime method has been hijacked so that in the end of the original code, you can see a call to send to your event. And the data will be sent to the attacker. Well, um, in this demonstration, you're going to talk about an, an application and a server called BridgeBank. Well, BridgeBank, believe me, that they have lots and lots and lots of money. Um, so this is a place where attackers would probably uh, want to attack. So um, in this application, the application, the, the, the low-level uh, implementation was being hijacked. So that what we're going to see now, we're going to put our user over here, and let's have a server. Let's have one attacker there. And in our attacker, well, our attacker, let's, let me just make sure that I'm running on the correct machine. Yeah. Look at this. Um, well, when the attacker receives the data, data will be written into this uh, directory called received info. So I'm going to put my attacker over here. So basically the flow be something like this. The user will enter his, his credentials into the path through the application, through the runtime, and into the received input directory, right? This will be the flow. So, let's take our uh, attacker figure, see what's going on. And, well, let me put here my credentials, but I'm, I'm going to write something which is wrong, so this is blah, blah, right? And as I log in, take a close look what happens over here. So, logged in, but access is denied. File was created. Let's go back, and now, now I, I, I authenticate as I'm supposed to be. Now let's go uh, to the background of the machine. Let's see what it says. So I can, I can see that the log file says that the user has tried to log in with password blah blah, and the, the user has tried to log in with password one. So, uh, and this was in a demo of uh, hijacking the forms of authentication. about another attack on the same method, well, this is another attack vector. Now we're attacking uh, Authenticate, but only now uh, we are inserting a backdoor into the Authenticate method, so that now uh, we're talking about adding this piece of code. This piece of code says, and this is very similar to what developers like to do, it says, if you have some specific magic password, this magic password will let you in into any account that you like. Right? And the code says, like, that, well, if the password is magic, it will let you in. If I will look at the same thing after disassembling it, editing the code, basically injecting this code, assembling it back, and decompiling it into C sharp, so we can have a better look at it, it looks something like this. Okay? So this is the if, uh, basically, now we can uh, enter into any account. Well, another example that uh, uh, we'll see later on, this is, this is about reverse shelling. And in reverse shell, basically what I did, I took uh, an implementation of Netcat. Basically, let me do it in a million uh, ways of, of uh, doing the same thing. What I did is I took uh, a coded uh, version of Netcat, pushed it back, the executable, into the runtime. And when it's something is executed, and Netcat is being deployed to this, and executed. Well, you can do it in very uh, other ways. For example, you can inject, you can inject it into memory so that you will not have traces. But basically, uh, the idea is to execute code when some specific thing happens. And in our example, the code was injected into application run. Run is a method that which being called each time an application is executed. Basically, this is like a main in a C, C++ application. And the code that was injected here, well, this is a code that says, as we can see, this is a pre-injection code. The code is injected into the beginning of the we can see code that says, well, call uh, our own reverse shell method. Basically, I've injected reverse shell before that. 
and pass on the parameters that the, the, the attacker's machine IP and the port. So this is all the attacker needs to do when reverse shell has already been ejected. So that uh, uh, um, all he has to do is just pass on the parameters to the stack and close the, 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 the We'll see a demo of that later. Um, crypto attacks. Well, crypto attacks, the, those attacks are very uh, uh, important and very interesting because crypto, this is something which directly relates to security. And when we're, when someone attacks your crypto libraries, basically um, he's creating a false sense of security. Because you're trusting the crypto libraries, and for example, you you think that you've done everything correct. So basically if someone, for example, and let's talk about some examples, some attack scenarios, uh, key fixation, when someone fixates your key, you're thinking that you're, you're encrypting uh, with, one, with your chosen key, but you're encrypting with another key. Um, key stealing, for example, stealing the, the correct key from inside the crypto the, uh, uh, class using the uh, center URL. Or algorithm downgrading, for example, the application asks for AES implementation, what it gets back is easy crackable desk. And an example code for that is that and if you, this is the degenerate key um, method, this is the method that creates uh, the, the, the key for the application. Uh, basically what I did is I reverse engineered this uh, method, throw away its own implementation, and now I have something that says return always fixated key. Again, from the user point of view, he thinks everything is encrypted. Well, the data looks encrypted, right? If you look at the data, the data, uh, uh, it's looking encrypted, it, you will uh, decrypt it, everything works fine, but it does not, you do not know that the, you, your, your, your key uh, is not relevant. Well, DNS manipulation. Um, in DNS manipulation, we're talking about taking the user to some place that he didn't want to go to. This is an example Java rootkit in which uh, a, a, a code that was injected into the, the DNS classes so that when a resolving will be performed, um, for instance, for, for a server called www.forexcodeserver.com, um, the resolving will be performed to the attacker's IP, right? To the attacker's uh, machine, www.attacker.com. Basically, it looks like this. So if we, this is the original code of, of get by name, this is Java's implementation of, uh, of performing DNS uh, resolving. Uh, .NET is get host addresses, basically the same. Um, I've injected the code that something like this. So now, uh, if the call comes to resolve S, well, I overwrite uh, if S equals fork server, well, overwrite S and return S as it was supposed to. Um, I hope that I have a couple of minutes for this demo, so let's start it very soon. This is the quote server. This will be our client. Well, now the victim, supposed to usual run of demonstration, going to take backtrack. Backtrack is awesome, right? But um, now we're going to see it twist the backtrack and we use it as the victim. Think about what happened when you download OS from untrusted sources, right? Guys, stop downloading OS, uh, uh, ISO OS from uh, Emulo Bitrum. Might contain, your system might be hacked. So, I'm going to use as a victim a Linux machine. And the interesting thing is that class that I wrote and it's it execute as it's supposed to you to be on Windows machine. I've deployed the same class on Linux machine, right? So, uh, and this is where, where uh, a virtual machine comes uh, into place so that um, my user, um, let's put it over here. And now we're going to perform a man-in-the-middle attack. So let's take our own attacker and the attacker has his own man-in-the-middle server. As you can see, he's waiting for a victim. Let's put this guy over there. So, now I can see that there is separation. It's different machines, guys, different IPs. I'm not cheating. So, as you might see, as you can see, and take a close look, 
uh, when I do a connect, connection is supposed to be happen to Forex code server to here. Um, take a close look, you will see that connection will be open first over here. Well, it might be too fast, but I hope that it works out. Connect and... It is not the end of it. Well, basically, I could have stopped here because taking the user to the wrong place is bad enough, right? But here, the attacker's mission was to make and to cheat, to, to fool the user. And it, with this, we are talking about a quote for a server. So I want to make the user looks like, um, for example, uh, the British pound is something which is worth buying. Let's say this. And this, and well, the user sees that, and they say, "Hey, great, great British, British pound. Let's buy a couple of those. Give me ten thousand of those. Great. Transaction accepted, and the user was was fooled. So this is the end of uh, this this demo about uh, DNS manipulation. Let's like let's take let's take a look about other. Um, stealing connection strings, this is something where uh, the, application, uh, the application is performing a lot of interesting things. Um, and one of the important things is timing. Well, in timing attacks, um, your attack is supposed to be uh, executing when some specific thing happens. For example, stealing connection strings to databases is supposed to happen when application uh, opens a connection to the database, right? You cannot just put some code in some very uh, general uh, place. Uh, you need to do it in some specific place. And I wanted to inject code that, that does something like this. Well, take uh, this uh, dot connection string and send it to the attacker. But the thing is that I cannot inject it into the constructor of the object. I need to, to inject it into a place that I know that where it is being called, um, connection string will already be initialized. The right place to do that is in open. The application calls open, which is still initialized. Um, permanent HTML and JavaScript injection is where the, the, the uh, uh, code is being uh, injected uh, into uh, not necessarily code sections, but code templates. For example, um, HTML blocks, JavaScript blocks, and stuff like that. So we can inject, for example, permanent cross-site scripting, uh, we can uh, perform proxies, many in the middle, uh, defacement attacks, and one of my favorites, calls to browser exploitation frameworks such as XSS shells. Right? You all know XSS shell, right? You know XSS shell, guys? Great exploitation uh, um, Picking into secure string, this is where we are uh, uh, stealing data from uh, uh, something which is called a secure string. This is a string that contains, uh, this is a string which is encrypted in memory. Well, if the string is encrypted, this is because someone wanted to hide something which is very valuable. Let's steal it from there. And this is the code that can do that using, again, send to URL. And the last one, we are talking about disabling security mechanisms. Uh, here we are talking about disabling the, 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 the virtual machine own uh, mechanisms such as Java, uh, Just, uh, or .NET CAST. Uh, basically, um, uh, if you have some kind of code access security, this is like an ACL, but for code, so that we can say what class can do and what method can call and everything and stuff like that. Basically, if we take a look at, at the configuration, the application will not behave according to configuration. Again, if there, there will be some kind of, of auditing, um, security auditing would say, hey, everything is fine. I see that configuration is, is it's supposed to be, but the application will not behave um, as it should. Again, um, false sense of security. Um, but those are just examples. Uh, as you can see, uh, as you can see, sorry, um, you can implement what, what you want. If someone hacked your own virtual machine, you can perform other kind of things, and basically, uh, the sky is the limit. Um, there are some advanced topics to mention. For example, uh, uh, post-platform classes can perform many interesting things. You can deploy classes, to, uh, custom classes. Uh, you cannot, you, just, you don't need to tie the code to the specific uh, machine, to the specific CPU. Uh, there are runtimes like enterprise service bus, web services stacks, application servers, database, um, stuff like that that already contains virtual machines. 
As an instance, uh, SQL Server 2005 contains an internal implementation of .NET Framework. You change the database group. And we can also talk about the multiple uh, change rootkits, or second order rootkits, in which we're having an OS level rootkit, so for example, kernel level rootkit that hides the presence of MCR and MCR hides on the application. Remember, uh, MCRs are not targeting the OS, they are targeting the application. And the last thing that I want to talk about, now I'm going to talk about uh, .NET Exploit. Um, this is a tool that I wrote uh, in order, to, um, in order to, to, to show as a proof of concept that things like this can happen. And basically, .NET Exploit is not necessarily an evil tool. Uh, .NET Exploit is a generic .NET framework uh, language modification tool so you can uh, perform, uh, uh, you can change basically your, your language. Uh, it's an open source tool. You can download it, change it, modify it, add modules to it. Um, you can even add more languages to .NET Exploit. So basically, uh, and, and, and you don't necessarily have to run it on Windows. You can actually run it on Linux using the Mono, mono uh, project. Um, well, .NET Exploit contains most of the attacks that I talked today and another couple of examples. So download it and play with it. And the concept with .NET Exploit is that you're developing a general purpose um, models. Models can be either a function, a function is a general purpose method. Um, you can you, you develop payload. Basically, the separation between payload and method is that you don't necessarily have to mix them together. And references is when you're injecting code that contains call to some DLS that wasn't there before. And an item. And an item, um, it's very interesting because an item is the model that ties them all. An item looks something like this. An item is an XML that describes basically um, where we want to inject our code. So basically, what, what is the target DLL? So we can see that we are uh, changing MS code lib, and this is the location of MS code lib. Um, we want to inject, for example, this piece of code. right? And the location of the code, so this is the hooking point, this is where we want to inject our code, and what is the mode, what is the mode of operation, where, whether we want to inject it as a pre-injection, post-injection, or we want it to replace all of the code that was there. Um, and let's see the last demo, the last demo is about .NET exploit, performing a very intensive task of injection, injecting a reverse shell into the .NET framework on implementation. And the task is that we are performing a conditional reverse shell that only when a specific application called sensitive application, right, has been executed, a reverse shell will be opened back to the attacker. So um, let's go to our machine. It's fast because we don't have much time. So uh, I'm run .NET exploit, and I'm going to load. One of the items, there are many items here, I know that the last one, conditional reverse shell, and I'm going to start. So now what it will do, now it will go to this directory, take this DLL, perform the compilation of the DLL. After decompiling the DLL, it will inject the function reverse shell generic. Um, after that, it inject the function called reverse shell private generic. After that, inject the, the payload, which is conditional reverse shell form, in a mode which is pre-append, so that code will be injected at the beginning of the, of the function. Basically, if I wanted it to, call, uh, to be executed at the end of the function, all I had to do is change the configuration, right? So, um, now it's in pre-append, and after it will finish, it will recompile it back. Basically, reassemble it back into a DLL. And basically, it will generate a new DLL for me, so that this DLL uh, will later be used to replace the framework on DLL. So that uh, basically now I'm, I'm going to change the dotted language, so that uh, now the injection will be performed into run. Remember, run run is when applications are being executed. Run is been is being called. So now when run will be called, uh, 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 it will check whether the name of the application is a sensitive application. So as it's, it's done its operation, it asks me whether I want to generate deployers. Well, deployers are batch files. Uh, this is a deploy and undeploy batch files that will be used on the modified machine. So that, uh, well, you, we don't need to take .NET Explorer to, do, to the uh, modified machine. All we have to do is to take the DLL and the batch file. So um, uh, I'll execute this command. So .NET Explorer is finished. 
And going to run the sensitive application to show you that I didn't deploy it yet, so now I'm going to execute sensitive application to show you that nothing happens. So, and this is sensitive application, nothing happened. Well, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to deploy the DLL, deploy, that's it. Now I'm going to run the same deal, the same executable, and if everything works as fine as supposed to be, a reversal will be open on the right side. Ah. Let's see who we are. Yeah. So. Well, um, this is scary stuff, right? Someone messes up with the uh, runtime, so basically code reviews of on a runtime that has been tampered with does not mean anything. You should not trust the runtime. So basically, wh what we can do, I'm calling for action for, for example, antiviruses and host-based uh, uh, IPSs to block runtime tampering attempts. The same kind of behavior that I'm expecting a decent antivirus when, for example, a malicious process um, uh, 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 tries to, uh, for example, change my host file and the antivirus says, hey, some process is trying to do something to your operating system. I expect this antivirus to tell me that some process is, is trying to change my managed code environment. IT guides should perform file tampering detectors uh, using, for example, Tripwire, but do, do it on using an external machine. Auditors, pen testers, forensics, look for your evidence inside Virtual machines know about this kind of shit of, of things. Um, developers, you should know that uh, your application is secure as the underlying uh, virtual machine, right? Um, virtual machine vendors like Microsoft Sun. Well, basically, this is not a direct responsibility of them, but uh, although it's not a bulletproof solution, they should raise the bar a little bit. Today, it's too, too damn easy to do. Um, and of course, end users, all of us, we should know about this kind of thing and we should verify our runtimes. Well, for more information about this research, um, you should uh, look at this uh, page. The, 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 those are the, the, this is where the slides are, white paper, .NET exploit tool, tool, source code, basically everything. Um, it's important to mention Ken Thompson, who talked about C compiler backdoors. He talked, uh, the first guy who talked about the backdooring the compilers. And Dennis Cruz from the OS.NET uh, uh, group talked about the dangers of full trust application. Well, um, to summarize, um, we all we all seen that malicious code can be hidden inside the virtual machine, the application level virtual machine, as an alternative place for uh, hiding malware. Um, We're not just talking about kernel, BIOS, uh, places like that. We're talking about another place for vectors. Um, very interesting attacks can be devised using the techniques like that, so be careful. And, well, it does not depend on any specific vulnerability because, basically, um, it's not restricted to any to any kind of machine, to any technology. It, we're not just talking about .NET, Java, or stuff like that, but uh, uh, um, a custom problem, uh, sorry, a generic problem that we have. And uh, last thing we saw, .NET exploit, the generic language modification tool that simplifies the process of .NET modification, but... Um, I want you guys to remember that .NET Sprite is not necessarily an evil tool. Uh, I used it as a custom, uh, as a custom uh, uh, tool. It can be used to, to modify the framework, but it can be also used to be used uh, to uh, basically to modify the framework, create your own version of a .NET framework, uh, generate customized mod frameworks, um, tiny framework, secure framework, performance framework, stuff like that. So guys, uh, if you have any questions, I'm right over there at room 104, and thank you very much.